Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Our guest today is Stephen Halaznik, a serial entrepreneur who has built six companies over the last 25 years, each of them which does seven or eight figures per year in revenue. These companies range from financial services to building rentals, and he spends most of his time working to help provide timely and crucial loans to small businesses around the USA. When I spoke with Stephen during our intro call, I got the feeling that he was a man of dedication who knew how to manage his time well and trust his partners, which are both extremely important skills for any serious entrepreneur to hone. In this episode, you'll learn more about how to build up a business and delegate most if not all your responsibilities, so you have the free time to build a second business, a third, and more if you so desire. Today, we honor his ability to create and automate processes that work well. So let's give Stephen a warm welcome. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Thanks for joining us today, Stephen. I know it's early for you over in the States. You were working for Xerox, a well-regarded company that's known for printing. When did you realize that Xerox wasn't ready for the future? And what made you think you could do it better by starting DigiPrint, your first company? I mean, the division I worked in, Xerox, was one of the most progressive companies in the United States. I mean, they had digital printing, laser printing. I mean, they were doing some things with digital printing, which was totally far and above what all the other companies were doing. But it wasn't a matter of they weren't being progressive. Uh, it was a matter of, um, like, I left when I was 30 years old. I had been there for eight and a half years. When you're in corporate America, which, by the way, I loved working for Xerox, and I, I might have even continued to work for Xerox. They treated me great. You know, at the age of 17, I, the vision that I had had was I wanted to start my own company. I mean, keep in mind, so when I was 17, the two biggest people in business were Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, you know, and they really had just started their companies. And so for, you know, people in the 80s in the United States, you know, we're known as the money generation, right? And we kind of thought about money a lot. That was kind of like what you aspired to. But anyway, at the age of 17, um, I wanted to start my own company. Uh, like I thought I would at, once I graduated from college. What I thought I would do is go work for a big company first, make my mistakes on their time, learn, grow, and then start my own company. And then I got into Xerox, and I really loved my, my work. I was one of their top sales reps in the country. I was promoted five times over eight years. And then two things happened, or three things happened. One of them was a recession hit in the United States, and I wasn't getting promoted again because the older people in the company were getting the jobs that I would have gotten. Number two is I had reached a level where it was time for me to switch to management versus sales. And um, I knew I wasn't really great at politics. And I wasn't, I wasn't that type of person. And number three, my wife and I were going to get married. And um, she knew my dream of wanting to do my own business, which I had continued to work on and develop those skills while even while I was working at Xerox. She said, listen, we're going to get married now. You know, I know you're unhappy at Xerox because of you're not getting the promotion. You know, I, all I did was talk about what type of businesses I would start. And she's like, N maybe now's the time for you to do it. My wife gave me permission to start it and she had a good job. So what I did with Xerox, I worked for a year and a half for Xerox, half a day without them knowing it. And then the other half a day, I started my company. So that's how it kind of all began. So it's kind of funny that you that your wife told you to go for it at the time that you're getting married. My experience in Asia is that 
normally if you don't have a business by the time you're married, that your wife will try to constrain you and force you into a traditional nine to five so that you can have a stable job to support her and whatever children you may have and her family and, and all that. So I, I love that your wife was so supportive. And, and obviously, if she hadn't been, you probably wouldn't be where you are right now. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Keep in mind that I think um, it all depends on the person. I tend to be a go-getter and I think my wife recognizes that. And, you know, so I think she, she kind of had a lot of trust in me. And so I always had a plan. I mean, I didn't just leave Xerox. I, I worked there for a year and a half while my business was growing, you know, so, you know, I had a plan. So what was the hardest thing about getting started with DigiPrint? I want to give you an idea of how intent I was on starting my own business that I, it was always something I thought about and worked toward. Um, so between the ages of, for example, between the ages of 26 to 30, I went back and I took something called cases from the Harvard Business School at a local college. And I took that same course for four years because every week you would learn a different business case. And the whole idea why I was taking that class was to become better at being a business owner. Now, the, the thing that was crazy was I spent these, you know, all these years I wanted to be a business owner. And the number one thing I didn't come up with or didn't work on was like a great business idea. So it was like, you know, then my wife and I decide to go ahead and move forward with starting my business. And I kind of didn't have an idea for a business I would start, which is really the kind of the screwed up part. What a huge mistake. So what I did was my mentor at the time said, you know, start something you know. And so I knew a lot about digital printing already. And so, you know, that's the first business I kind of went into. Okay. So how did that end up turning out for you? How was the first year? So what happened was the first year I did good. You know, I, I made $60,000. And again, this is 25 years ago, um, my first year. So what happened was I, I needed to test the market. And this is something that I've done in every single one of my uh, almost every single one of my businesses, being able to test an idea to see if it's going to work before you, you know, invest a lot of money and, and time into it. And, you know, it's one of the biggest mistakes a lot of uh, young business owners make. They have this great idea and then they don't test to see if, well, does it work? Are people going to spend money on it? So what happened was the equipment for digital printing at the time costed a million dollars each. And, and I've never let money stop me from anything. Um, and so what I did was I said, okay, let me test the market to make sure that this digital printing, which is kind of digital custom printing on demand and customized printing, it was just like this new type of technology. Um, and I said, let me test it to make sure it work, you know, I can build a market here. And so what I did was I went out to meet with other companies that already had the equipment and I contracted with them to do the printing and do the work. And I went out and I got the business and then I would bring it to them and my customers didn't know it was being printed somewhere else. So they didn't care either. And, um, and so that allowed me to learn the market to see if there was a market there and to build cash flow. Uh, which is always really important. And so that's what I did for the first year and a half. So how did it go? Well, it was about two years, I think, DigiPrint started. And again, this is kind of a rinky-dink, you know, compared to the businesses I have now, you know, it was my first business. It was kind of, you know, not very good. Um, you know, it ended up in my second year, I made $80,000. But the most important thing was it taught me that the people who were in the business that had the equipment, we're not making any money, that the market wasn't there, and that the printing industry is a terrible business to be in. There's just not a lot of margin in it if you're doing big jobs and anybody can have like this little printing press in their garage and can print and, and, and also digital printing and um, custom printing. There weren't many people doing it. So I did it for two years. I believe it or not, I ended up selling the business for like fifty thousand dollars, and then I moved on to my next gig after that. I have to say that's quite smart for you to go to other companies and have them do the work because you never had to 
lay out any money for inventory, including those expensive machines. I think someone else might have had the same idea as you, but tried to put together a million dollars to buy the machine, and they're probably still kicking themselves 25 years later. Yeah, I saw a lot of those people who bought those machines do bad. So, um, yeah, you know, it was uh, – the the other thing that, that I've learned over the 25 years is that it really takes a business owner three to five years, I'd say closer to three, to really know what they're doing, you know, with their business. And it takes 10 years to learn how to be a really a professional business owner, you know, learning all the nuances uh, of being a business owner. You know, you don't want to take all that money and waste it in the beginning. There's this term that I really believe in, something called pivoting. And pivoting is where you kind of get in the business that you're in doing one thing and then you kind of learn about something or learn about the business, learning about your customers, learn about your product and you pivot in another direction after you've learned some things. And I think in the first couple of years of any businesses um, that y- you're, you're pivoting. I definitely learned about that uh, when the virus came because the first two years we were focused on one product and we were getting close to actually being able to launch. We'd already started talking to investors and then the virus hit in you know January, February time. So by March, we knew that there was going to be no money for our product. And what we saw was an opportunity to pivot into remote work because the the core architecture we had for our software was already based on chat and it was enterprise level. So we had the core aspect that you need for any kind of you know, enterprise software. And then we just had to figure out what to do with it and eventually came up with remote work. And I think we have a much better company now and development is much smoother. And it's been an interesting eight months, but it was necessary to do that because we, I feel like we're much more like a real company now. I think it's on a different level than what you're talking about. I mean, you know, every business has its own course. One of the things I've learned when you have a business I know we're all thinking about growing, growing, growing that business. But one of the things that you should think about is what will happen in my business if a recession hits? Because what has been proven true is that every 10 years, there is a recession that happens and it's major, a major recession that happens. A lot of times companies fail during recessions, but maybe what we should be doing is all thinking about what would happen to my business? What would I do during a recession? Because a recession is going to happen. You know, I don't know if that would have helped you in your business at all. In this particular business, the virus was actually good for us because investors are going crazy for what they're calling the future of work or work from home. We looked at the market and we pivoted into what we knew investors were hungry for and what companies are desperate for. None of the businesses I've ever built which are between six and 25 million in yearly sales. None of them have involved any type of angel funding or any type of VC money. It's all been growth through existing cash flow or uh, you leveraging that cash flow to get lines of credit from banks. So, but it's interesting when you talk to young entrepreneurs nowadays, because all they ever think about is investors, investors, investors. And so, you, you know, I, you know, respectfully, when you just when I asked you that question, you you focused on the idea of well, my investors want you know wanted us because of this, this, and this. Whereas, it, whereas when you ask me that question, if you asked me that question, how did I pivot or whatever? I'm focusing on the market I was in, the product, the service. I'm focusing on that. And so you know, I went in. At one point in my career, I spent two years looking at angel funding deals. In other words, I was going to look at at providing funding to companies. And and so I kind of know a little bit about the angel funding market. You know, a lot of times what I saw was, you know, business owners who focus all their time on getting investments and not focusing their time on the market that they're going to go after or that their execution strategy It's just a different way of thinking, I think. Yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot of people I talk to that are looking for investment, they say, 
they take, you know, sometimes up to six months of just focusing on investors and that takes away from their time to deal with, you know, the market and the product. The idea will determine if it needs investor funds to compete or if it just needs, if you just need to build a business that's, you know, reinvesting the cash flow or, you know, self-funded, so to speak. You know, I think the there's just a lot of people out there who just think that investing, getting investors is the number one way to build a business. And I would tell you, like, I have quite a number of friends who got investor money. You know, they built their companies and were successful at it. And they didn't make as much money as I did building a small company uh, that, that kind of lasts a long period of time. So anyway, I mean, I think the idea comes first. I think you you come up with the idea, you think it's a good idea, then you decide, okay, yeah, I'm going to need to go the angel funding route for it to work, or no, I can just build a solid small business. Yeah, I think the problem for a lot of people that want to be entrepreneurs today is that they're all young. A lot of the people I know that are building their first company are in their early 20s, and if they've gone to college, chances are they've got debt and they're living with their parents you know, they've got student loan debt. So as much as they would love to be able to bootstrap a, a business to profit, they just don't have the means to do it. And I think outside investment is really the only way that they feel they're capable of doing that business at all. I get it. But I think that there's other ways of doing it. Like what I did, look, I worked for a company full time during the day. And, and then, you know, the other half, um, I did something else. You know, so anyway, everybody has his own path. I get it. Your next company, I think, was expertseeker.com. Am I right? Yes. So you started this company in the early days of the dot com era? Yes. So what inspired you to start this company and what was your decision making process for how to start it and how to grow it? What are the skill sets I've always had? There's two. One of them is I, I recognize opportunities very well. And number two is I, I am really good at taking an idea and having it come to fruition to be to implement it. I'm, I'm really good at that. I'm not afraid of moving forward. And, uh, and I'm really good at like if there's a brick wall, I'm good at knocking the brick wall down to get through to the other side, sometimes with not the most great of political skills, as I mentioned in my days at Xerox. Okay, so I knew DigitPrint wasn't for me. Right, it wasn't going to work. Always read a lot. You know, I kind of knew what was kind of going out in the, uh, the the world. You know, the big thing at the time was the year two thousand bug, which was you know they needed to fix the code. And then there was other things I was reading about called ERP, enterprise resource planning, and a lot of companies were implementing big, huge software packages. And so what happened was I went to work for my sister as an independent sales rep. She had started her own business, and she was bringing people in from overseas um, into the United States on H-1B visas to work in technology. And so what I would do is help her kind of place those people into companies. And while I was doing that for seven months, I, you know, combine that with what I was reading, I saw that there was going to be this huge pent-up demand for expert-level consultants people who were like the best at what they did in technology. And then at the same time, all those cases I studied, cases from the Harvard Business School, one of the number one most reoccurring themes that you saw was that big companies move from variable costs to fixed costs. And that's how they're able to get their pricing down and really beat the competition when you get bigger. You know, that's how you're able to knock out all the little companies that are out there. But it also is a big problem for them. So you know, it's really, really hard to cut fixed costs. And so one of the things I thought of at a young age was, you know what, if I build a company, I want to build a company with a lot of variable costs. So that way, when the recessions hit, or if I want to pivot, I can easily cut back or, or make a change. And so I liked the staffing business because I was like, wow, so if there's a problem, I can, and I know this is going to sound terrible, but the biggest expense in a staffing company is is people. In other words, your your salespeople, your recruiters, your administrative staff. And it allows you to ride the wave of a growing economy and cut back when there's a recession. And I thought, wow, there's gonna be this big demand for for really high-end technology people. Plus, it's, it's got a lot of uh, interesting variable costs. So, and the third thing was, um, 
I think I can borrow money against my future receivables to be able to fund it. And so I started uh, Expert Seeker, and it went from one million to three million to five million to six million in five years. And the profits were fantastic. They were really, really good. And I was also, you know, learning how to be a business owner. And boy, that was an adventure for me. There's a lot that you learn in the early years of being a, a business owner. You know, you make a lot of mistakes. My mistakes are usually um, managerial, which is usually my, my weakest skill. So Expert Seeker just had this several years of really great profits. And at the same time, I'll tell you a story. I, I, uh, this is one day my accountant calls me up and he goes, I need to come in and see you. And anybody who's ever, I don't know, been through this knows that it's never good when your accountant says something like that. So he comes into my office and he goes, Steve, he goes, um, you have to pay $280,000 in taxes this year. Luckily, I had the money, but I knew I had a tax problem going forward because we were making really good money. And so at that point, what I did was I bought a beautiful dilapidated 10,000 square foot office building and I, I fixed it up. So, you know, that ended up being one of the six businesses I started. Not only did we save money on taxes by doing that, we ended up uh, using two floors for our own company and then we rented out three floors to other businesses. And that building, which I still have today, has allowed me to borrow against it for a line of credit for my other businesses as well as to produce cash flow. Today, it's known as passive cash flow, right? But it allowed me to produce cash flow that would help me during times when things were maybe not going so well. The way I got into Expert Seeker, I kind of just paying attention to the market. But it was also important too when I got out of that business because what happened was the 2001 recession hit, uh, which was the 9-11 recession. I've now named these recessions actually from my building, which are 40 miles outside of New York. It's, it's built on a hill and I can see the skyline of New York, but I actually saw the smoke in the horizon because it was a crystal clear day. And when those towers fell on the TV and I could see again, the smoke in the horizon, I knew that my business expert seeker was over. And so over the next couple of months, I got rid of staff and, and then over the next three to four or five years, I kind of ran Expert Seeker into the ground because I knew that the year 2000 bug was over with. I knew that work was now going overseas, and I knew that people weren't spending on ERP because major corporations were going into a major recession and are cutting back big time. And so I then moved on to my next company while Expert Seeker was running, but I didn't spend any time in Expert Seeker. I just let people run that business. I spent actually six months trying to figure out what next business I was going to go, go into. And uh, that ended up being healthcareseeker.com. Explain to everyone why you used money to buy a building, because maybe they don't understand the purpose of, of, of that. There's a few reasons. One, you can get depreciation on the building. So, you know, you're able to appreciate it and you get, you, you can write it off over 25 years you, uh, or you know, in the United States. And there's a, there's a tax benefit for that. Number two is I was able to take the cash from that I was earning from Expert Seeker and to pay for the $750,000 in renovations that required the building. So, you know, I actually didn't ever, ha I didn't have a mortgage on the building. I just paid, I paid cash for everything. And that I was on a cash basis versus an accrual basis. So that allowed me to reduce my tax burden. So, you know, there were, there were a variety of tax benefits. Um, and then of course, going forward, I didn't have to pay rent any, anymore. I was paying rent to myself in essence, and that's another advantage. So you were having money from Expert Seeker pay rent to you, and you were essentially then able to take profit from the business as income through the other business and then keep it as really income for yourself. Yeah, that's part of it. But, but that's a, I think the bigger part was um, you know, the ability for us to – put our cash, the cash that we were making into another business um, was, was a tax benefit. So were you also putting cash into Health Seeker from Expert Seeker? Expert Seeker and, and DigiPrint, 
they were bootstrapped. And it's like I started and I kept reinvesting. And it was, you know, it's it's rough building a business that way. So with Healthcare Seeker, which was what we did was we placed registered nurses on long-term temporary assignments throughout the United States into hospitals. Expert Seeker, I got in on the bottom and I rode the wave up of demand. With Healthcare Seeker, I actually got in at the possible the worst possible time. I got in and at the height of the market, and then the market started going down, and then a major, and then then a recession hit. And I, I got in healthcare seeker because I thought it was recession proof. It was I thought being in healthcare that it was going to be recession proof, and and I was really wrong. So to answer your question, when I got into healthcare seeker, I invested money quicker. I hired people quicker. I, I, I hired a director of public relations and lead generation. I hired uh, two recruiters. You know, I put more money into advertising. So, you know, within the first six months, I spent $350,000. And that, that was unlike the businesses I had done before and even the business I had done after. And then we got caught with the recession going down and I was ready to pull the plug on, on healthcare seeker. It took me three years before the company actually started to generate a profit. Certainly the lesson you learn here is start small, you know, just keep testing the market. What ended up happening with healthcare seeker is we then caught a wave back up and we grew that company to 7 million and we became, we were on the Inc 500 fastest growing list of companies in the United States. And uh, we grew it to 7 million. And then guess what happens next? Uh, the housing bubble? Yeah, the housing bubble came. We were on track to do 11 million. We were going from 7 million to 11 million, then a recession hit. So I thought, all right, recessions typically last 18 to 24 months. And I said, you know, let's ride this out because I think when this recession is over with, our business will do good again and our competition will there'll be a lot less competition well what ended up happening was the recession in the united states ended in 24 months but the the recession in my industry lasted seven years what i learned is that recessions in your industry can last a lot longer than the global or local recessions and then uh you know there's other lessons i learned i never had a business partner up to this point I, I now have a business partner and who had started his own businesses and very successful one and sold it. And uh, both he and I were so wary of what to do during recessions of the, at this point that when we started our other companies, we built companies that were cyclical, uh, that were counter cyclical to one another. So whereas one would do well during a recession, another one might not. And so we had a plan for what we would do during a recession, which has come to fruition right now in the 2020 uh, pandemic recession. If you look at the stock market, especially hedge funds, a lot of hedge funds will look at the market and they'll make an investment in something they think will go up and make an investment in something they think that'll go down so that they can hedge their bets against the other one in case it, you know they lose money some in, in one of them. So you took this idea and put it into the creation of companies. I think that's really cool. It seems to have worked. I mean, one of the things you, you learn, I learned is like, you know, when you talk about hedge funds, I mean, they have billions and billions of dollars to play. They have a lot of what I'll say chess pieces, right? You know, they have a whole chess piece. They have a whole chess board and they're always thinking strategic. You know, when you're a small business, okay, you have one chess piece. <laughs> you don't have a lot of options. You don't have a lot of moves. It's a real problem for a recession where like a small business, yeah, they can cut back on their costs really, really quickly. But once your revenue really dies down, you don't have a lot more moves to make. At least in our case, you know, we had some moves. Now, keep in mind now, looking back at it, my building – is a hedge against a recession. Then I have a financing company, uh, Financing Solutions, uh, you know, uh, and then I also have um, a funeral funding business. When one is down, you know, right now Financing Solutions is down, but my funeral funding business is up and my building is up. So, you know, it allows me 
to stay self-employed. <laughs> it allows me to make still good money. And, and it's been, you know, a good lesson, I think. How did you actually make the decision to take away some of your time from those other businesses so that you could focus on starting the next one? One of the problems I didn't like about Expert Seeker was I was always working in the business and not on the business. When it came to Healthcare Seeker, I wanted to work on the business, not in the business. So I hired an operations person very quickly. So very similar to what you're doing, Sean, which I think is really, really smart. And that is if you can have either an employee or a partner like that can focus on the internal operations while you're focusing on something else, I think that's really the best way. In fact, you know, I have a business partner right now and he's amazing. I'm so lucky I have, you know, that we work together and he's really good at the working on the inside where I'm really good at working on the outside. I'm really good at the marketing, lead generation. In fact, you'll never grow in size past like 3 million in yearly revenue if you don't have somebody working on the inside while you're working on the business. The first year I spent mostly just learning how to be a CTO and a project manager building the product, the wireframes, the documentation for how everything is going to look and feel and, and work and what's the navigation between all the screens, everything like that. Once I hired him, I felt like things were actually starting to move because I was putting so much energy on the product that I didn't have the ability to think about anything else. And not only did he help me to be able to focus on other things, but he also found where I was sucking at what I was doing and created processes for me to follow so that I could do the product management better. In the last six, seven months from that point when we started looking at it until now, the development side has gone super efficient. Like I never imagined we would be this efficient. So I totally agree. Trying to find someone that can help you do things better by allowing you to step away from them makes it so much easier to think about how you're going to grow the business. You can also get there if you say, well, I can't afford operations direct or, you know, I don't want a partner or I, or I haven't found someone who has the right skill set to be my partner. There's other ways you can do it too. You can, you can hire a part-time assistant to get some things off your desk. One of the things I did early on was I took one of my top employees and I said, okay, in, in addition to your job, I'm going to groom you for the second position job. And now I want you to start, you know, managing all the staff. And she was so excited about it that I didn't have to pay her anything extra, right? She ended up, by, by the way, doing really well with me. I mean, she not only worked for my one company, she came back to me and worked for me for two companies. And, you know, she became my operations manager at Healthcare Seeker, which she did a great job with. And, you know, she ended up doing very well financially. So there's other ways to skin a cat. I think the concept that you have to work on is, you have to be working on your business at least some of the time instead of working in your business. You know, if you shouldn't be the one all, always going out and getting investor funds or you shouldn't be the one always going out and talking to clients and, you know, it should be a balance. Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, I plan to use some of the funding to hire, you know, customer service people and salespeople and business development people so that I can focus on more of the long-term vision and going back to the product because for me, the product is my vision. And so, you know, kind of like Steve Jobs, without being an asshole, I want to be very deep in the product for the life that, you know, for the lifetime that I'm, you know, part of this company, because I know that what I want to do is really unique. And it's important for me to be a part of that. How has the pandemic affected you so far? You said the funeral is doing well. What about the other businesses? Because you have four. Yeah, so they're all doing well, which is is good. And the only thing that happened with financing solutions is we did reach, you know, we we laid off quite a number of people, uh, and we did it really early. You know, I I sometimes worry that maybe people might say, oh, you know, he's heartless. He can let people go so quickly. It's never easy, and we always give him a good package usually, or give him a lot of notice. But you know if the business doesn't survive, it doesn't help anybody. With Financing Solutions, uh, we had learned um, from other competitors 
that during the last recession in 2008, they lost half their portfolio. So in other words, is they had a lot of losses during the last recession. But then what happened was the industry came storming back and their portfolio went up 100%. So we were kind of thinking that that's what would happen to us. But what happened in this recession for financing solutions was um, we didn't lose any money. None of our clients stopped paying us, um, you know, within reason. And, and we did really well. The only thing that has happened with us is people, companies had stopped, stopped using their line of credit. And so our portfolio is down, but we didn't lose any money. They just haven't been using their line of credit. Uh, with Elite, Elite just continues to go, uh, Elite Funeral Funding, so what we do is we buy life insurance policies uh, when a loved one passes away so that, so that their family can have uh, a funeral. Because usually in the, uh, you have to wait 60 days to get paid your life insurance money, which the family usually uses for the, the funeral, which is funerals cost on average about $10,000. So we, we give that money up front and then we collect the remaining money from the um, insurance company. That company has done really, really, really well. And we have people uh, running it for us. We have, I have two other partners in that business. I, I didn't mention that. So my business partner and I own 60% of the business and our partners who are the managing partners who run it own 40% of that business. And it's been a great business for us because we, we don't really have to work in it at all. We really just provide the financing and we provide the advice uh, to the to people running it on how to run a business. And then the, the building, of course, the building's done really well through the recession, people would say, well, it has, hasn't everybody worked from home? Doesn't everybody work from home? Well, the, the building I have has a lot of indie, uh, let it, a lot of separate offices, like single offices. So a lot of people who didn't want to work out of their home were looking for office space to, you know, stay away from the kids or, you know, stay focused. So the building has done really well. You know, again, we cut all our expenses for financing solutions super early and that really gave us a, a lot of time to kind of, um, you know, ride this whole thing out. And we think that as the recession progresses, people are going to come back to needing a line of credit. And our two biggest competitors in the United States went out of business already. So, you know, we kind of think that we're going to do well. I'm glad that all of your businesses are going well. What have you learned recently and how do you plan to implement it? Where I spend the majority of my time right now is lead generation. So, and what I mean by that is marketing, how to get prospects to come to us. So the, you know, what I'm always learning is um, new potential channels on how to get more clients to us. That's where I spend all my time. So, you know, things such as SEO, search engine optimization, search engine marketing, direct mail, uh, advertising, you know, I'm always learning something new in that regard. And so just to, so to, I want to answer your question more directly. When the recession started in March, I said from my experience, okay, what's the best use of my time right now? How can I use this uh, recession to get our company better? And our number one best lead generator is search engine optimization, natural searches. And so what I did was, you know, I've always had um, a, com a company that manages that for us. And what I decided to do was to learn SEO from a technical standpoint myself. And so right now I spend a huge amount of my time just trying to make our SEO strategy, our SEO implementation better so that we get more and more and more leads, not only now, but going forward. So everything I'm learning right now has to do about the technical end of SEO. And, and now what I'm doing is after, so, uh, what, uh, ever since March, five months, or more than that, what, seven months, um, what I'm doing now is taking all the things that I learned and delegating it down to other people um, so that it starts to free up my time again because I got – now I was working in the business to learn something, and now I want to start getting 
out to work on the business again. That's a really good skill to have right now, for sure. I know because of the podcast, I got really interested in learning about, you know, MailChimp and newsletters and funnels and, you know, how to write great emails that people want to open. And that's been really interesting because for the longest time, I was letting my team look at these things. And now I have my own opinions and my own skills that I can add value to what they're doing as we prepare our strategy over the next few months to, you know, to execute as we launch and bring people on. So yeah, it's interesting. We've kind of both spent this time learning vast amount of skills that are extremely important for building the business. Well, it's the number one biggest skill that I think drives a business. I think it's the number one biggest skill. Lead generation marketing is the number one most overlooked skill. If you have a great product or a great service and no one knows about you, then you don't have a business. And and I don't believe that hiring a salesperson is a marketing strategy. And word of mouth about your company is not a very good marketing strategy. You have to have a variety of channels from anything from social media to direct mail to email campaigns to uh, SEO, SEM. You know, you have to have something that works or a variety of things that works, or you're never going to grow your business past any sizable level. So the last question that I normally ask people is, what is the most important piece of advice you could share with everyone? Would you say that's the most important thing, or is there something even more important? No, I I mean, definitely that's my theme, you know, where I say lead generation and marketing is what drives a company. But I mean, from an overall business owner standpoint, I, I would just tell you, being an entrepreneur it, it is a marathon. It's not a race. And in a marathon, you can't just run the first mile as a sprint and then the second mile, you know, you, you coast. You have to be on the best at your game every day and you can't work. You should not be working like killer hours. You know, you shouldn't be working 78 hours a week because you will burn out and you'll pay the price not just in your business, but also physically and mentally. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years and I'm always very cognizant of my energy level and my my enthusiasm for the business. You know, that's the number one thing I would say is manage your time and your energy wisely because it's the number one biggest thing that's going to affect your success. I love that you said that because the motto that I have and I say it Uh, and every podcast and every blog article that I write always is entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. Those are the exact words. And then, you know, on top of that is if you let it, your life will become only your business. And, you know, that's, you're going to look back and you'll, you know, yeah, you might love that you built a business and I, and I I get it, but you know, you're going to be unhappy. So, you know, have a balanced lifestyle, family, health, friends, business, you know, have a healthy lifestyle. So how can the audience find you online? Financingsolutionsnow.com is the website for financing solutions. So if your revenue is over $400,000 a year, you would qualify for a line of credit. You know, there's other things we're going to look at too, but in general, 400,000. If you want to get a hold of me, you can always email me at steveh at financing solutions now.com. If you have a question or if it's something I can help you with, you know, feel free to contact me. Great. Well, thanks for your time. I really appreciate you, you know, sharing a lot of really great advice today and it's been fun. Sean, thanks for having me. It was fun.